animals play an important role in building healthy soil. In fact, they can increase the organic matter and help sequester more carbon, which is good for the planet. Have you ever wondered what the difference between grass-fed, grass-finished, uh, pasture-raised, certified organic meat is? They're not all the same. There's actually significant differences between a few of them. And if you're wondering how animals actually make healthy soil and what the difference is between all those terms, you're in the right place listening to the right conversation. Ian and Linda Gossert of How Park Farms, which is a multi-generational farm, help us pull those terms apart and deepen into understanding how animals are actually really, really important in building soil health and sequestering carbon, which impacts climate change. They farm with their son, Zach, and they have Ian's dad around as a consultant and an encourager. They're a multi-generational farm. They're awesome humans, and I'm really excited to bring this conversation to you. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor-in-chief of Heart Soil Magazine. If you want to check the magazine out, go on over to heartandsoulmagazine.com and you can join our community for just $39.99 a year, where you get access to the magazine and special Q and A's with myself and Leslie and contributors. And if you haven't subscribed to this channel yet, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe and hit the bell. So you don't miss out on any of the interviews. You make yourself an amazing day. Enjoy the conversation with Linda and Ian. Thank you so much for gifting us this time for us all. And what I thought we would do is we'll start off by helping clarify some terms around the types of different of farming that there are around animals and then talk about um, how you use animals to make healthy soil and maintain and repair a pasture. I would love to clarify some terms that we hear in the meat industry, such as grass-fed, grass-finished, pasture-raised, organic certified and um, because as a as a farmer it can be confusing and as a consumer it can be even more confusing so yeah <laughs> uh, let's start with what what's grass fed um so i mean that that's a challenge because depending on who's marketing it i mean really any beef is grass fed at some point in their life so for us like our animals are grass fed their entire life so they don't get any grain but but there's nuances in the industry that because really the, the organic um, there's a standard and it's it's backed by the government of Canada grass fed there's there's a lot of different companies have their own standard but there's not a there's really nothing saying like you could put grass fed on any package of meat as as I understand it and you'd be right and the consumer may be thinking that they're getting product a but they're actually getting product b so yeah it's um so yeah grass fed is a it's an interesting term and then and then you get consumers so interested about grass fed that they're they're wanting their chickens grass fed well chickens naturally eat seeds so then you do like we have ours out on grass but they're getting fed a ration of of grain and and bugs and, and frogs stuff and every day so yeah all of this isn't uh there's a few differences in there, I guess. That, right. Know. So when we think about grass fed, <clears throat> pardon me, and grass finished, what is the intention behind that? So what are what are we hoping for as a consumer? I um, think that the hope fed? is that the 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 omega three six ratio is mm -hmm. more in balance. Like once you start feeding more grain, then it elevates the omega sixes. And that in a person's body that causes more inflammation, the, the higher the omega-6, like omega-6 oils have more inflammation in the person's body. So I, that was kind of when they first started looking at grass fed, well, the meat, it's got a healthier ratio. It's more close to that one-to-one -one ratio is what um, I understand you want. But, and then as you put them on more grain, then, then that, increases omega-6 so mm -hmm. i think that's yeah. the, the big piece of it for for the beef and then the other part is if you're kind of mimicking nature i mean ruminants are meant to digest grass and mm -hmm. so from a health perspective 
it's really considered a healthier meat because it's so much higher in the omega threes and or the or the balance is better because I mean yeah mm -hmm. yeah what I understood when I first started researching it um because we are we are our cattle were mostly pretty much grass fed when I was growing up and and on our farm and then when I moved out to Saskatchewan um I married somebody who had cattle and was used to grain finishing them and we switched them all to grass fed and so I really started to dig into the nutritional differences and and from what I discovered it looks like the fat um ratio actually completely flips so it goes from being super high in saturated fats to being super high in essential fatty acids the fats that are good for our brain and our bodies right yeah. right yeah it's fascinating and what about um and so how do we verify it as a consumer if we're looking for grass fed and grass finished? Um, because I, from what I understand, when we finish a, an animal and grain, that actually changes the meat again, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that. that's where you where you start flipping your fatty acid ratios. So then, yeah. So, so then we might, if we're finishing an animal with grain, then we almost might as well just be eating a regular um, beef that's being raised with Pretty much. Grain. I mean, okay. I guess the, I mean, the only advantage say with, um, so I'm trying to think some of the grass fed protocols are similar to the organics where they don't allow antibiotics or growth, mm -hmm. growth hormones and those kind of things. So, I mean, um, if you're feeding an animal organic grain, well, then they're not getting the, maybe the glyphosate load and those right. kind of things with the, with the grain that you would on the, in a conventional, conventional yeah. like if you buy your Walmart or Costco beef. Um, yeah, that's so, there's so many things to think about. And so there's one piece for the health of the human and the health of the person who's, or the, the, end, the end user of that meat. And then from an environmental perspective, what is the difference between a grass fed animal and an animal that's raised on grain? I guess, I mean, the, the grass fed and finished, I mean, they're more out in pastures. Mm -hmm. um, and so you don't have the like concentration of nutrients like a feedlot has in like, so you, I mean, and there's, there's two sides of it. I mean, you're going to get some people saying, well, um, the feedlot animals, I mean, you're just damaging one part of the environment and then you get other people that don't, that are really against animals for, for carbon right now. Mm -hmm. They're saying, well, we shouldn't have anybody grazing grass. So, mm -hmm. um, because there's an impact on all those acres. And, and I mean, I guess for us, we're, we're trying to impact those acres in a, in a positive way with, with hoof action and, and mm -hmm. um, and moving them around and um and i guess the like basically for grain finishing I mean, you, you have to have them in a feedlot to feed that grain it just it makes life a lot easier for the, or mm -hmm. more efficient i guess mm -hmm. and so the best way for a consumer to figure out if something is grass-fed or not is really to kind of follow the trail of where they're getting the meat from or yeah. Yeah. Like if you can buy local, buy then local. you can have a chat with your producer and say like, what, what are you actually feeding this animal? Like, I, I want to mm -hmm. know. Cause, and lots of times you'll have that conversation and you kind of have to push the, because some, well, we, we don't really feed any grain. Well, but then, then you realize, but they do, oh, we, if it gets really cold in the winter, we'll feed, we'll feed something. It's kind of like, so then, then it becomes really hard, like to know what. Right. Um, so as a consumer, I would say, yeah get to know your the farmer you're buying your meat from mm -hmm. Go and visit the farm if they don't want you to visit there's a red flag right there why don't yes. they want you on their farm to see what they're doing yeah are the animals born and raised completely on that farm or do they bring them in and out because that then there's no guarantee as well right yeah, i mean you could look like the other thing you could if you really were interested in a if they had a grass fed accreditation yeah. asked mm -hmm. to see what, what that entails. Like, yes. so what, what are mm -hmm. the standards they have to meet? So then that, because it is, it is hard for someone in a city to, to either come to the farm. Right. So, I mean, but if they go to the local grocery store and say, okay, you're saying this is grass fed, can you provide documentation or whatever that I can research this farm or what is the, it has this grass fed logo from whatever agency. So then you could do a search online to say, mm -hmm. okay, well, so what are the criteria to meet this standard? Mm -hmm. Right. And so um, questions to ask would be, um, what do you feed your, what do you feed your animals? 
yeah. Um, yeah. During That's the winter. Primarily the one. And before they um, go And to, then I guess, and then how are they, where, how are they housed? Like, are they kind of out on, on range and grass most of the time? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then before they um, go to the, to the butcher for harvest, what are they fed for, for that period too? That would be an important question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. And what about pasture rate? So, okay, wait, before we move to pasture rate, so grass fed, what, what animals are typically um, labeled or designated grass fed? It'd be mostly like beef and sheep, I guess would be probably the main ones. Buffalo? Um, Bison. Bison, yeah. Bison? Yeah. Yeah. And maybe elk, would they too? Yeah, you can like, yeah. You, you really have to to watch though, because lots of lots of bison producers feed grain. Oh yeah, it's true. Yeah, so just then because it's bison meat doesn't just, mean it's it's raised the way a bison naturally. Yeah, I love that you brought that up because I've always thought that was so interesting. Um, because when we put bison onto the grain, then it almost just turns it into the same. The same. Oh, it's the same as feedlot yeah. beef, because I, I mean I yeah. I don't know if I've seen any studies specifically on bison, but I'm pretty sure that that's going to do the same thing to that fatty acid ratio. Your your omega sixes yeah. are going to go up through the roof. And, it's probably yeah. no different than your your deer or your elk that graze in your neighbor's corn field right. all winter. They're not right. wild game anymore. They're going to have no. yeah. Uh, it's changed a lot, hasn't it? And what about um? So pasture raised animals, what, who, what type of animals are pasture raised and what does that mean? You could probably have any other type pasture raised. Like, so, Mm -hmm. I mean, we have pasture pigs and that means our pigs aren't in a barn. Like they're out on pasture for the summer, um, like not as big a pasture as, as the cows would have, but in Mm -hmm. smaller areas outside, um, access to grass the same with our chickens like we're there in mobile Birds. mobile pan so any chickens or turkeys or ducks geese. ducks geese yeah um even like goats i guess would be another they mm-hmm. could be they could be pasture, pasture raised, raised or, or gra- mm-hmm. even goats could be grass finished i guess yeah mm-hmm. um and then i mean it'd be kind of a specialty market but there could be rabbits that would be mm-hmm. pasture, pasture raised, raised. yeah yeah yeah, and, okay. and there are maybe not so much in Canada, but Europe a lot of a lot of rabbit is eaten. So then they could mm. be pasture raised, just like the birds, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Organic certified. What does that mean? Tell us about that. That I mean, that's a certification that you're meeting the standards set out in the Canadian Organic Standards Boards, basically, mm-hmm. and it's it's a national standard. There's different certifiers across the country that that are accredited to make sure farmers are meeting the standard, basically. So we, with that, I mean, it's it's all encompassing. Um, I mean, our documents probably that we have to file every year with maps and everything. I mean, be in excess of 100 pages of mm-hmm. questions that are asked. Um, mm-hmm. um, we have to have records of all our our cattle. And then if we have if we have to treat one with antibiotic, then that has to be flagged and tagged out of the system so it can't be sold as organic. Mm-hmm. Um, the all the land that the cows graze on, all the feed that has to be documented where we got it and that it's it's all organic. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just the the processes we can use for for grain farming. I mean, we can't can't use any any chemicals or or chemical fertilizers we can use compost or we can use and then anything that we want to use we have to get it approved by our certifier so then they they look at the ingredients and they'll give us a make a ruling and say yeah that's fine for organic or no you can't use that because of of what this component that's in it or something like that Mm -hmm. so So, go ahead linda so for for grain then if there was say a I don't know what an uh, an amendment, soil amendment, or something that somebody wanted us to try. We couldn't try it until the certifier body. Mm. It's okay. Same yeah. with animals. If we want to um, try and treat them with homeopathic remedies, we have to have that approved before we can use it. So um, and and 
some will get approved and others, they might not know enough about it, so they won't approve it. So then we can't use it, so. Wow, even with the homeopathics. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. I think there can be a lot and of confusion it, around um, pasture raised and regenerative farming and organic farming. And so where does organic farming fall in comparison to grass fed and grass finished and pasture raised and regenerative? No. It can be two separate things. You can be an organic farmer and not do any pasture raised or regenerative practices really i guess you well do i mean they're, they're certainly practices. in the in the organic standard i mean they look it looks at soil health so what are you doing to improve your soil yeah. health so there's there's certainly a, a kind of a crossover but well linda's right there's there's certainly vegetable farms in california that are producing certified organic um produce that if you looked at the tillage and and what's going on to and the i guess maybe the like the what do you call it? those mats that they lay down to right. control weeds like that really aren't helping the soil health mm, at all but so you know, i mean no. and then there's i mean there's certainly dairies in the states that are organic that are like ten thousand head and so i mean and there's certainly been been debates over time on how like are they actually are they meeting the organic mandate i mean mm -hmm. And regenerative, I mean, it's, we try and here, we're trying to follow a lot of the regen principles. Mm -hmm. um, so we're kind of, yeah, doing organic and regenerative is kind of what our, what our focus is now, I guess. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, well, I was born and raised on an organic farm a little, and pretty grassroots. So I'm a little bit biased because I really think um, organic is regenerative in its nature. Yeah. And even when we aren't um, following all the quote unquote regenerative practices of no tilling, organic um, farming is is regenerative in nature. It's gra it's grassroots or regenerative nature, and even farming organically with no chemicals is um, even if there's tilling and even if there's that ground cover and even if there's these other quote unquote terrible things that we're doing that aren't. Um, falling into the regenerative story or the regenerative narrative, there's still no chemicals being used in these practices. And I think that's right. something that's really important to presence and amplify in the organic space yeah. and, and look to see how we can move towards more regenerative practices, right? On those big, massive farms and um, the big, massive uh, dairy farms and, and that type of thing. And, um, it's curious how much weight um, being a farmer who uses chemicals and no-till and how um, amplified that can be as regenerative. And they're still using a massive amount of chemicals, like massive, massive, yeah. massive amount of chemicals. Yeah. And the regenerative thing they're doing is no-till. So I, I love that. And I think that's a super, I think that's a huge stride forward to regenerative practices and at the same time it's interesting that we can lift that up so much and then totally squish an organic operation that is using no chemicals and tilling the land like i get it i get the i get the conversation around that and i also want to presence that um i think there's there's really a lot of value in both and like how do we just how do we like how do we just learn from each other and how do we lift each other up and and move the whole farming movement forward towards learning from each other and um standing on each other's backs as like as a step up instead of like squishing each other down yeah well i mean yeah. and i i found that like organic farmers for sure like are more willing to share what mm -hmm. they're doing i find and probably the regenerative group we're involved with too certainly you can bounce stuff off but whereas yes sometimes now i mean it's it's pretty cutthroat out there like if land comes up i mean it's just kind of whoever has the most money kind of comes and and takes it or or even land now is maybe not so much here because there's not as much rented land but i think in saskatchewan there's big tracts of land that can change hands like thousands of acres yeah. in a year if somebody comes in with with 10 more dollars an acre and then somebody just lost like 
several sections of of land kind of thing so yeah yeah that can happen for sure so um i also wanted to talk about just the stigma around animal farming and using animals and because there's a lot of stigma around um that we should not be consuming meat and that we should not be farming with animals and it all should be vegetables and plant-based and so um i I, I grew up in a family where my dad has been vegetarian since he was six. And so we hardly ate any meat. Um, and the meat we did eat came from our farm. And uh, when I moved out since Saskatchewan this past, um, I guess, three years ago, I, for the first time in my life, did not have access <laughs> to meat that I had grown. And I just wasn't up to building fences and growing my own meat. And that's how I found you guys. And um so I, I do, we do have meat in our, our home and um, having certified organic meat is really important to me because I know, and, and knowing the farmers is really important to me because I know that, uh, I know your practices and I read a lot about you and I phoned and asked a lot of questions <laughs> before <laughs> making the choice. And um, I'm curious about what makes um, your, the way you farm unique and special i mean i guess like if you look at the regenerative principles one of the big principles is getting animals on the land mm -hmm. one animals on the land but also having a green living root on the land as much as you can well i think zach in the in the notes that he he submitted there to you a while ago mm -hmm. that's you can do that with animal i mean like our hay ground i mean it's it's covered 365 days a year, same with all our pastures. And so the people that want to just eat vegetables, I mean, the, on one hand, that's fine, but one, like there's a significant amount of fertility that comes from these animals that if you don't have composted manure or something, so those vegetable farms, okay, so what are they going to put on the land to, mm -hmm. and, and I guess the other thing is, is we've got a lot of land here that isn't, it's not, what you'd call number one farmland you wouldn't be growing peas and carrots on it mm. so if you take all the animals away from that what's gonna what's gonna maintain it and i guess the other thing on our specific farm is land that we've never broken we're part of the general mills regen program and they did some um meter carbon cores here three years ago and so they did it in one of our grain fields, which is the, our project field. But then I said, like, go and do a couple spots in our pasture. So they did, I think, three, they did six different sites in our pasture. Mm -hmm. And so we've got organic matter here that's still 15% versus those tilled fields are like 6%. It's wonderful. And so to tell people, okay, well, let's go and break all this land up so we can grow carrots. And then you know what the end result, and, and right now, like, when we're worried about carbon, well, well, our pastures are storing a whack load of carbon. And so if, if people across the country get the message that, well, we just want to grow, want you guys to grow grain, don't have any animals, then all that land's going to get broken up and oh that God. carbon's going to get all released. And so, I mean, I think, yeah, people aren't maybe thinking of the whole picture there when saying, well, yeah, animal agriculture is bad. Well, the other thing is, I think, because where we live is so unique all you have to do is hike up the top of our hill and look and you can see for miles and so from the top of our hill you can see in our fields and our pastures there's so many places for wildlife insects birds all of that to live you look out and it's a bare field right now especially it's a bare field there's no place for any insects to live or for the winter. The wildlife is wide open. Um, they have no home, no shelter. So of course they move into the hills for the winter, but, but that's the key thing. And so if you're really concerned about animal welfare, don't just be concerned that you're eating Bessie the cow, because if you're eating peas and lentils and beans and all of that for protein where that gets growing there is no bees insects that can live 
for many months. They can only live for one month on those fields when they're flowering. Mm -hmm. And then right. Right. So and that's, especially that, that's kind of um yeah, that's kind of it. It's it's the whole picture that you've got to look at. And so the animals, even if you choose not to eat them, are a necessary part of that whole ecosystem to exist. And if they're not there, that ecosystem will die. Mm -hmm. Just like in a city, there's it's dead, right? I I explained that to one, you know, a summer follow black field, and they said, well, what's growing there? And I said, nothing. It's literally like a coffin. It's dead. There's the, it, the life under the soil is also dying because it's got nothing to eat, right? Mm -hmm. so in a conventional farm, you feed it and you feed it and you feed it. But at some point, it's going to die. It's just not going to mm -hmm. produce the same as it did for generations, right? Right. And and especially if those peas and lentils and are chemically sprayed and all the yeah have the, has been sprayed with chemicals right then then yeah. where is the balance in that yeah because that also speeds up the death of all those other things right yeah because that's right we know that all of that affects our gut it also affects the gut of the insects mm -hmm. the birds the animals everything mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, yeah. I love. I'd like to get a poster. I don't know. Do you have you seen that show Yellowstone? That series. Yes. Yeah. Well, that I don't know if you remember the one where he's talking to that lady that's an environmentalist, and and he said because she was she is a vegetarian and and so then they got talking about the soil and soil health and he basically said to her he said well so if you're just growing carrots or whatever and you're tilling it well you're you're killing all that all the microbes in the soil so he so he said my question to you is how cute and fuzzy and cuddly does something have to be before you're not all right with killing it for your food and, and i'd love to have that poster in my office because because that, that that said volumes about soil health actually yeah that that's yeah that's really really powerful um so did you say that your pasture has 15% organic matter and your, your um, crop fields have 6%? Yes. Wow. No, and are you working at building? Crop field, but... Yeah, you're working at, you, and that, but that was three years ago. So you're continually yeah. working on building that. Yeah, I mean, 6% in this area is huge. huge. Like most of our neighbors conventional probably be around 2%. Yeah. Percent. Oh yeah, no, we've, so you have really light sandy land no, or no, we, we're, a, we're a clay clay wow yeah where the grain fields are yeah, yeah. okay and and the, the really sad part about that is is that grain field would have been better quality land at the start than the pasture but because the, the pasture was wetter so the grain fields got so they so they we were probably higher yeah 15 organic. to 20 percent organic matter probably when at some started. stage yeah so Wow, that's impressive. So the the land that the cattle are grazing is is um actually health what we would consider healthier today than the cropland. Fascinating. How do you use animals to make the soil healthy? Um, so yeah, and really you can use animals to destroy soil, and you can mm -hmm. also use them to make it healthy. So I mean, if you if you want to make it healthy, we try and um, have have them on different areas for short amounts of time mm -hmm. and so yeah in our cover crop year we'll grow multi-species so that that's one thing we can improve the soil by a whole bunch of different species and then maybe the animals only get a couple acres a day and then we do just, just small areas and so they impact that for a day then you move on and then that starts regrowing and it, it stays green like we don't you don't um, graze it totally off. You leave, say, a third of the material there. Mm -hmm. um, so it provides shelter for the soil. And then it also, you still got living roots in the soil that are still doing um, some good. Now, if on the other hand, if you want to just take that same area and just put steers on it and graze that whole area, say a quarter section all summer, um, and graze it right down to like half an inch or an inch, like a yeah like a golf course green mm -hmm. then you could really seriously harm. harm your soil health and 
And in doing that, I mean, then you bring a whole bunch of different weed species that that can that'll enjoy that kind of system. Mm -hmm. um, even even um, like prairie dogs, gophers, mm -hmm. they they need a line of sight. So anybody that's complaining that they have a lot of gophers, that means they're they're grazing their grass way too far down. Like when we started letting our pack, because I used when I was a kid, I used to shoot gophers every weekend. Well, we don't really have any here anymore because we started letting the grass grow. Well, then they don't have a line of sight. The gophers coming out of their holes, so they they move somewhere else where they can find a line of sight. So that is really cool. I did not know that. I just learned something. And so with um. Can you give me an example of, say, um, so a quarter of land in Saskatchewan, I guess, might be anywhere, is it 100, around 167 acres, right? 160, yeah. 160, okay. So help, help me understand what the difference between letting out the cattle all on the 160 acres for the whole entire summer, instead of doing that, doing the rotational grazing, like breaking that field up into different sections and then moving them from pasture to pasture to pasture. So I'm wondering two questions. One is, um, is uh, what, what's the difference in how many cattle that amount, that area can sustain? Like, does it, can it sustain more animals? And then also if over time it will. Okay. Probably not the first year, but yeah, over time it'll, it'll, as it get the soil gets healthier, it'll produce more grass. So then you will be able to have more animals out okay. there. Because the other thing too is that, um, like if you just graze the whole thing the whole summer, well, the cows go out there and they on every one of those 160 acres they graze the plants they like best first, mm. and they'll always keep coming back to that. So eventually you're gonna you're gonna get rid of those plants because they impact yeah. them so much. And so then the ones they don't like as much is what's going to end up taking over the pasture and then you've and then a lot of times that becomes weeds too eh? like we like yeah. we have issues with leafy spurge here and and you see pastures around that, that people just let their animals in all, and so then the spurge just really takes off when it's overgrazed and and uh because the cows don't eat it and so then it, mm -hmm. it and yeah foxtail is another thing in in saint more saline areas that that if you over time if you're just they're just picking out their their favorite plants well they don't like it and then it just becomes more and more dominant so so the other mm -hmm. way to do that is also to mix animals so that if you not just have cattle but cattle sheep goat pigs chickens eat different like different like their favorites are different so then if you graze consecutively or in, you know you move those mm -hmm. around then each will eat their favorites Oh, interesting. Is that what you do? Um, some with the chickens and the cattle, the pigs more so are more into the bush areas, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. it, it's a challenge. I mean, ideally, we'd have sheep run with our cows, but yeah. then it's just different kind of fencing. And then yeah. the cows can deal with coyotes in our bush, whereas the sheep have have would have a, have a challenge. So, I mean, yeah, uh, we, Most we've of thought the time. about that. But and then every additional animal species well then that's more manpower more right? manpower or more <laughs> yes. hens and stuff so yeah so yeah. Even, even with the pigs in the in the bush pasture you have to rotate them frequently or they will damage things because oh, yeah it doesn't take yeah. long at all for pigs to root up um so what zach has done is he as he moves the pigs then he'll plant cover crop seed behind them oh, so and then smart. and then it's all that fertility is there and we had like sorghum and I don't know all sorts of things like growing wow. in places that you would have never thought would have even grown anything and um, are you just broadcasting we, are you just yeah. broadcasting that yeah he just yeah, does he a just five gallon pail by and hand, just right just hand. broadcasting it right into the a large area yeah. and mm -hmm. this yeah. year was good because we had so much moisture so right right and, and if it was not like, using the same areas year after year you keep yeah finding different areas and then you know go back eventually even with our chickens you just go to the top of the hill and you can see where those pens have moved the grass is lush and there's way wow. less thistle um there used to be a lot of thistles where we put the pasture chickens in now because of the fertility has changed yeah it's just so it's kind of neat that way 
but yeah, yeah the more mm -hmm. you could do that the better so if you even if you just had a small acreage and a yeah. few each animal that impact would be so much more beneficial than yeah. but yeah the larger you get or the more <laughs> the more animals the more people power you need as well right? yeah yeah that's so true yeah so how do you maintain the pastures then because um i think a lot of people are used to oh, well there's native pasture and they just like put it out year after year after year and just hope for the best <laughs> and so that's one way of using native pasture and then there's pasture that people replant every seven years or ten years depending on what their cycle of repair and replenishing is and i'm wondering what what your strategy is it's different i mean certainly probably bulk of our pastures native mm -hmm. so then it doesn't ever have to be replanted and and we try and um and rotationally graze them and and the more we get into some of the um the high stock density on on our grain land then we've got the equipment to go and do some of that on our pastures too and just trying that um but it does take a lot more time than just just opening a gate and throwing animals in for three weeks or a month but um so yeah that's and i guess the like some of our grain fields that are kind of the most degraded well then we'll seed them to grass and then we'll have animal impact for a longer time on mm -hmm. those ones too like and then that that's a way of kind of rebuilding soil on on pieces that we've acquired that are are significantly damaged i guess you'd say mm -hmm. and i guess with our native pasture because we have a a, sig a significant amount and not too many animals to move the rotational grazing is is not the same rotation every year okay. so each season um each year you hit that pasture at a different season so mm -hmm. the first year it might be first thing in the spring but then the next year it might be late summer so that you're not hitting the same plants at the same stage so that has made a huge impact in our native pastures of when we because you're not grazing the same pasture at the same time mm -hmm. all year right they're only there for a short period at the start of the season and then a longer period they might go back there but not at the same time every year each year is different when they go into that pasture does that make sense yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, so do you have any, so most of your land is not, do you ever broadcast seeds into the native pasture or is it always self replenishing? I have mixed feelings about that. I mean, I know lots of people do it. We don't generally, and in my mind, I mean, those native plants have, they've evolved to be here for the last, whatever, 10,000 years. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, and, and I shouldn't say that like in the nineties, I know I direct seeded some alfalfa into some of these spots. Well, it, it just went away and the natives just kept going. So, I mean, and I know people will go and spray glyphosate and then direct drill in and, and it'll, you might get some benefit for a little bit, but it's, it's not, I mean, the, that's the thing. The, these grass species have, yeah, have evolved for thousands of years here. And, and I think they're the ones, yeah. And, and that's why they're still here in that, and they're resilient and i find even last year in 2021 when we were so dry well our pasture grasses they they'll still grow whereas if that had been all alfalfa well then the alfalfa was just absolutely horrible here so um mm -hmm. so it's yeah i mean you can make an economic case for alfalfa it'll grow a lot but if you get the wrong climate conditions um it's a world of hurt so it is nice to have and we're fortunate too because we have a little spring fed creek and mm -hmm. and that helps the grasses along it um so then they're they're maybe stronger or, or or last longer than they might um but that's all part and parcel of our of the trees in the hills that that feed that creek and it's all part of the whole yeah. ecosystem so and i think yeah nature has a way of, of yeah that resiliency is so important because the plants that are are native to here grow here best and when we try and introduce like sorghum it's not a native plant so it doesn't grow the same way as like big blue stem right like those plants are all synced together in a very unique pattern of the species that grow in the native pastures, right? The flowers all each 
each plant flowers at a different time so that the insects have something to feed on throughout the whole season. And they've, they've developed that naturally. And when we are trying to mimic a cover crop, we try and mimic that, but again, they're not, because they're not native to the area, they don't adapt quite as well. Same with the animals. If they're born and raised and grow here for generations, those animals do better on the grasses that are here because that's what their bodies adapt to. It's like us trying to eat lettuce year round. It, we do great on the lettuce that grows in our garden, but when we ship it from California or wherever, it's probably not, it's nowhere near as nutritious as it was when we picked it from the plant in the garden, right? So it's the same thing for the animals, I think. Um, yeah eating it so yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense and something I really um hear from you and I feel a lot of passion for you is about the native plants and holding the space for that in your farm and I'd love to know what resonates so deeply for you about that why is that important to you uh, I'm not sure I guess that's just kind of what we inherited and mm -hmm. um and really the, the land that the natives are on are is land that you wouldn't you wouldn't till and put a field. So I mean there's there's this range of hills that I mean you wouldn't, I mean, I know when I was in university, a prof that had never been here, he said, Well, you should just get that seeded with an airplane. But I mean, not having the understanding that the topsoil is like half an inch thick and it's just gravel and so yeah i guess it's just we've been here and and trying to work with nature and and using the what's best for for the situation i know the one quarter of native that's got the creek in it a friend of ours that's a soil scientist well he's retired now at u of m he did a use it for a case study for a number of years and and he thought it was really neat because right along the creek the soil association is called the tadpole association so mm. he said i could the students would look at that and he said that it wasn't hard to convince them that you probably wouldn't be growing soybeans on something that's called the tadpole association. So that's, so yeah, that's a lot of what we do is trying to have the land work with it in, in it's what it's best suited for really, and not try and um, not try and yeah, put it into a grain field that really that that's not the best purpose for it. And I think as we've done more, um rotational grazing stuff with our native the the native land grass species have gotten stronger over the years um so it's that, that's mm -hmm. kind of neat to watch too i think mm -hmm. the unique thing is that we do is because where we are um i think we value the the natural space because you go other places and it's gone so i think to us it's so important to maintain it for future generations even the hills we it's a lot of recreational use could be used and and there's um a conservation area to the west of us that they uh have there was a wildlife management and now they've made bike paths and and hiking trails through and they wanted to continue that on ours but there was so many bikes it just eroded the hills and mm. and our whole thing is that we're just a caretaker caretakers of this land at this moment in time and mm -hmm. so for us to make sure that future generations still have the opportunity to see the wildlife and the natural native prairie we have to maintain it like that if we if we even opened it up for a recreation use it's going to change it will not stay the way it is so even mm -hmm. though we we don't derive boatloads of money from it mm -hmm. and pay taxes on it and really have very little gain from it other than a little bit of pasture that's okay with us and mm -hmm. I think because I think yeah just because the aesthetic and uh, the importance of having nature around because if you if we take it all away <laughs> life's not going to survive so yeah yeah what would you say to uh, a farmer who is used to just running their cattle um, on all their all their pasture land at the same time and 
maybe they're using chemicals and to grow their grains and to do all the things. And so what would you say to them as like, where would, where would they start? How would they, if they, if they're curious about transitioning to more regenerative practices, maybe even organic practices, where would they start? What is maybe three things that they could do to take the first step? I mean, I guess if they've got animals, like try putting up a couple cross fences, like don't, don't try and, and do an acre at a time, like what we're doing the, but yeah, try putting a couple of fences up so that you're, you've got the cattle in three different places over the summer instead of just the whole place. That's where I, I guess that'd be one place I'd try. Um, trying to think. The same with the chemical, like just try a little plot um, slowly mm. with the animals. Um, the thing is that the, bi the big thing in most farmers is the bottom line, right? And that's yeah. the hardest thing. And yeah. so we can't fault our neighbors who bulldoze every tree and spray chemical and get every inch of land for grain because that's how they make money. That's right. Um, and so they look at us and go, well, do you make money on this acre? And we'll know, well, then why would I want to do that? Right. So it's really, it's, yeah, really, it's, a, it's, it's a, a, a really challenging yeah. discussion is why would I want to farm like that and make less money? Mm -hmm. Right. And so only if their mindset is, okay, I want to change. I think Ian's answer is right. You can, it has to be gradual. You can't just flip because you will, you will really impact your income. Mm -hmm. If you tried to flip all at once, you'd be. Mm. I mean, right now, I mean, the organic prices are for the grains. I mean, yeah. the, there's really not much market for organic cattle it's actually really right now. It's really hard to find. But, um, mm -hmm. but, the, but the grains, I mean, they're much better. So, I mean, there is a, and just when I look at our neighbors, I mean, somebody's told me the other day, I think anhydrous is like a dollar a pound now. So, I mean, if you put a hundred pounds an acre on, well, that's a hundred dollars. And so, so both of Zach and I are thinking, well, yeah, we're glad we're not, we're maybe not having huge yields, but we're, we don't have those. Cause that's the thing you have all those costs and then you your break evens, maybe five or $600 an acre. And so if you make 600, well, you broke even and, and you've got millions of expenses. And so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, um, but, but I'm not saying we've got all the answers either. I mean, yeah. we've been working with this regen stuff and, and trying to do less tillage, but on the organic side, it's, that's not the only answer at this stage. Like we've, yeah. we've got a till to get rid of quack grass and, and thistles. Yeah. So. yeah. yeah. And if you're only doing an acre where you can weed it, <laughs> then just yeah, can't like, like you can't. If we could do our whole farm the way we do our garden, like then yeah. it would be amazing, I think. Yeah. And, yeah. But it's a challenge to do. Yeah, 80 yeah. and 100 acre fields or quarter sections this, with the same intensity as we do the garden. Yeah, I heard two really good um, pointers you said. One was um, to start like small and whether that's with a plot of land or with just um, putting up a couple cross fences in your main um, pasture area. And then the other one, which I think is really powerful, was mindset, because you said it was it's really a mindset. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's probably the one of the most powerful places to start because when we are connected to why we want to do something, then we always find a way to do something. Right. And so right. sometimes that you're right, the income might not be what we're used to, but they won't be having the high chemical bills going into that mm -hmm. piece right. of land. And there's really, I mean, the cost of cross fencing uh, pasture is not that much. Would you go with um, just electric fence? Yeah. yeah, that's what most of ours is, yeah. And you, it all and depends on your, like in some of our, like our bush pastures, I don't know if I'd go, cause mm, if you have a, yeah. a tree go down there, well then it kills your whole, your whole, yeah. whatever, the other five miles of fence. So. Um, but I mean, yeah, if somebody's starting up and they wanted to do something extra on a, on a, on a grain field, yeah, mm -hmm. then I would, cause they're pretty easy to, easy to put up and not, a high tensile and, and not, it doesn't cost a lot. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. cost -wise. Yeah. And I mean, there are a lot of programs out there for funding, right. For even water systems, fencing, um, so that they can help you 
get started in some of those little projects. And we've certainly mm -hmm. tapped into lots of those programs through the years, right? Yep. And so even somebody wanting to start out, even pointing them in that direction of, through the conservation districts of where they might be able to access some funding, um, even, even with, you know, even with chickens and pigs and things like there's little bits of funding here and there for things like that, right? Um, so where would, and where would they look for funding? Just provincial government, provincial I guess, like look under the ag department for because yeah. right now there's, I'm trying, a, there's a huge pot like from the federal government right now and, and like covering stuff like cover crop seed and um, and yeah, fencing the, like fencing and and dealing with riparian areas. So like offsite water systems, all yeah. there's lots of money for that right now. And even mm -hmm. even um, pollinator strips and like there's money for things like that as well. Right. So even for someone who's who's clear cut all their ground, you know, they may be able to get funding to plant some pollinator strips just mm -hmm. to help them shift that mindset a bit. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You're a multi generational farm and um, you you're was it your grandfather that had the farm or your father who had the farm in? Great. My great grandfather. Your great started. great grandfather started yeah. the farm. Yeah. So it, I mean, your farming roots are deep, and I'm just um, I'm wondering what keeps you farming, and why? Like, what is it about farming? Um, I guess the diversity, you. probably. Like, one to be, you can be your own boss. I mean, some some days I wonder. I really wonder <laughs> what keeps me going. But um, but yeah, to be your own boss. Um, and I guess right now like we're having an impact on improving soil and that's kind of neat and even i know when zach was coming back one of the things he mentioned was that you can actually like say at the end of the day you can look back and see what you accomplished like because he said like when he was engineering i mean you could you could spend all this time on writing reports and stuff and or, or submitting a bid and the company might accept that or they might not so you so then you really have nothing to show for it at the end. And he said where he was, I mean, it wasn't like he was going to be out building or anything. So, I mean, you're just, once you did the design for one building or whatever, then you're on to something else. Whereas here, I mean, you figure it, okay, well, we want to put this fence in and you actually go and put the fence in or, or you can see at the end of the summer, if your grazing plan worked and if your animals did better or worse than the year before. And, and so, yeah, there's, kind of those kind of things and um i think it, it his dad had a really good comment yesterday as we were cleaning carrots <laughs> he's almost 88 and he goes it's really neat to see how each generation um utilizes the farm and does things a little bit different um and so he goes like the things that i thought were important now are so different than what Zach seeing is important. He because he he just lights up when he sees what Zach's next idea might be to do, right? And so it's that's what I think is really neat about the intergenerational. He has been such a great mentor. I think for him, he felt pressured to farm because he was the only son, mm -hmm. um, and didn't necessarily think he wanted to, but did anyway even though he was a polio survivor. Um, and so his dad never let him make a decision till the day he died. And he died of cancer and was sick with cancer for 11 years, right? Yep. Wow. And so his dad swore he would never do that. And so he was a great mentor to Ian, started him making decisions as soon as Ian knew what he wanted to farm or wanted to farm, which is probably about age three. But um, mm -hmm. Ian's doing the same thing with Zach and it's really neat because Ian's dad says that oh I, Zach's making a lot of decisions now already right and and so he sees that and and I said well you were the you were the teacher of how that should be done right and so he's that's one of his greatest strengths was always being the mentor and never the judger I think oh. yeah really powerful yeah wow and what's your favorite part of farming with multi-generations of family well that's just it the multi-generations being able yeah. to 
Well, I mean, for me, like all the years I got to spend a lot more time than most people would with their dad. Like, so, so that was kind of neat. I mean, and, and we, we get along well. So, I mean, that was never a, cause I mean, I, I've got friends whose dads would throw hammers at them in the shop too. So, I mean, I was fortunate and blessed that, that I always got along with that and we kind of agreed on how we're, and, and a lot of the same thing is, is happening with Zach. Like he, he's has similar values to us as far as what what he wants to see from the farm and so it's 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 pretty easy to to let him make more decisions because he's making decisions that i would likely make as well and and some of them are he's making better better choices so yeah and and most of the answers on the written stuff that was that and so ian said isn't it interesting because he would he answered it a little different than i would have right but um and yeah he just i think it's kind of fun watching them change their or, or how they work together and how they make those different decisions because ian will if ian gets all um you know worked up about something zach's the calming influence and vice versa so it's kind of a i think that's the good thing about the multi-generation i think sometimes because there's the history so you know okay well this isn't the only bad year Right. Mm. We've had bad years before we've survived them or, you know, every year isn't going to be this good. So don't, don't, don't bank on it because we know, right. Do you know the history and um, that I think that's, that's kind of the neat thing with an intergenerational farm. Well, another neat thing that Zach said when, when he was thinking of coming back, he said, I can, I could go and work for another 10 years, wherever, but he said, that's 10 years that I'm not going to be able to get knowledge from grandpa or you. So he, that he made his choice as I will if I come now, come back I'm and then he benefit can benefit from grandpa. He can in suck years, knowledge out of both right. of those kind of things. So, yeah. yeah. And that's just, perfect. just get that history. Right. Right. So, mm -hmm. I mean, his dad's out here quite often and usually every Sunday for supper. So you get those really neat history discussions and yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's really well, for me, it's more motivating too. like if Zach's interested in in carrying on the farm. So it is kind of then you're I mean, because if if he wasn't, then we'd be looking at, OK, well, what are we going to do with this place? Like we're we're going to have to slow down whereas or change it or rent it out or whatever, whereas he's interested. So then you're then you can kind of continue what you'd started and that. To me, that's kind of neat. Like we've spent a lot of time converting it to organic and getting, mm -hmm. improving the pasture and working on the soil health. And so to be able to continue that is, yeah. is kind of a neat. Yeah, there's that motivation because we have neighbors who started to try and go down this path and have two daughters who have no interest in the farm. And he said like, this is a lot of work and I'm gonna lose some income in the meantime. I don't have the energy to do this because I'll probably only have 10 years more farming in me and then I'll probably sell. So he just shifted back to convention, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, and and you get why he would do that, right? Um, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you, what would you tell a, a new farmer who's just starting out? um breathe <laughs> yeah. well, enjoy I, the yeah enjoy the fresh air i'm trying this to might be your only enjoyment some days <laughs> i'm trying to think it's hard work. um oh, i'm trying to think of the quote i got a good good friend and a couple of years ago he just had a crappy year and how did he word he said i won't let the success of my farm dictate my success or my my image of myself and that's probably the key. that's probably the key for someone out starting out like don't just because you have a bad year farming don't make that a reflection of you personally um mm -hmm. got to kind of keep the two things apart and and be willing to learn like i think the biggest thing is ask a lot of questions mentor um get mentors right if yeah. you don't have that multi-generation and you're starting out get someone who will be your mentor or not just one but several 
Mm -hmm. educate 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 read 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 right never think that you know everything there's so yeah. much every time you think you've learned something then you there's a new thing and you go oh that's a whole different spin on that isn't it so we have to try and think again right it's like yeah well i got so, another another friend in the same area he said to me once he said i have all these people because he was just getting in he said i have all these people telling me how i should do these things and he said not one of them have ever done what i want to do yes. and so you get the get an ag agronomist and stuff that yeah i mean they've got a cushy job in town but they've actually never put the sweat equity in on a farm and to know that that i mean yeah if you that hailstorm comes through or you have a drought then yeah your income drops or and, yeah be solely and, dependent on that income right that I, I always love the mentors who, and yeah, through the General Mills program, all these guys tell you, well, you should do this and this and yeah, but they never have to rely on their income from that decision. They get a paycheck from <laughs> whomever, right? And so that's the tough part. Um, yeah. But if you want to farm, then you've got to put all your effort into it. If you're going to work off farm and try and do all this, you probably will you'll burn out you'll I burn think. out you won't be able to put the same amount of effort mm -hmm. to it as if you were constantly working somewhere else as well you will just unless you're superhuman you're gonna you're gonna so uh, something's gonna suffer one yeah, way either well, the job or the, suffer, right? or the farm or the marriage yeah. or whatever right like or your health your health uh, probably will be the key thing because yeah yeah and breathe yeah yeah breathe and and do it do what's healthy for you right mm -hmm. so if, what what one person can manage and do you might be overwhelmed with or you might mm -hmm. be able to do twice as much right so mm -hmm. do what's healthy for you and be happy with that don't think you have to do what the neighbors do right and to be successful yeah, I love that. I love those tips. And I think that's a great place to wrap with you, unless there's something else that you really, really would like to share that we haven't touched on. No, it's, uh, no, that's good. it's <laughs> yeah. pretty uh, broad, uh, broad <laughs> swath of things. Anyway, so yeah, it is. It was a broad, broad swath. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for your time. Really enjoyed yeah, no, I enjoyed this. Thank yeah, you. It's good to yeah. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day, and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.